I am Isander. He's Coda. Y'all are handsome. And today, Wait. what we're going to talk about is a little bit of Warframe lore. No, you're not. Yeah, Don't lie to them. Yeah, we are. No, 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 no. I'm Isander. Did I say I'm Isander? Yes. Whoops. I thought I said I'm Coda. Give somebody one episode. As much as Warframe seems like it's just a uh, gun go bang bang, uh, happy go lucky sci fi sh- looter shooter, uh, upon dipping your toes into the universe, you discover a bottomless void of weird and terrifying events. Sounds familiar. Warframe is the epitome of those gameplay versus lore memes with the, the, the something, somebody that I used to know remix. You know the ones, they're all over the place. But sometimes one of the strangest things about the story is how it is told sometimes being told in outright certain terms, and sometimes relayed to the player in veiled half-truths or even quarter-truths through confusing poetic prose by characters whose defining trait is literally being conniving lying assholes. It's weird that so many sci-fi settings love the unreliable narrator kind of trope. It's so bizarre. Um, So today, what we're going to do is kind of clear things up in a wonderful timeline. Starting from the beginning of the Orican Empire all the way up to kind of the current happenings. We're going to leave out the Daviri Paradox just because it's it's a weird side story. This is a lot of names you've thrown at me already. For the people who know, they know. For you, you don't need to worry about it. We're just covering the stuff that happens in reality is what basically all you need to know. For our wonderful future listeners, uh, the current events uh, that we are going to be leading up to, again, excluding the Duviri paradox, as of filming this, the last update that was released to the game and the story was the crimes of Kulervo. Obviously, this will contain story spoilers for a lot of the in-game quests. Almost all of them. So fair warning, if you do want to experience these quests in the manner that they were designed in the game, go try them out. A lot of them are pretty quick, but it does take a little bit of a time to get rolling into the story quests. But yeah, go finish them. They're really good. Um, Now, in keeping with our trend, we are going to start before the beginning. Oh, God. All the way at the beginning of the Orican Empire. The Orican our golden lords, instantly recognizable by their dress and architectural stylings of stark alabaster and porcelain white inlaid with veins of gold that interweave and jut out from surfaces to form ornate and flowing patterns. The Orican embody the apex of human development, ruling the origin system in its entirety with aspirations of expansion to new stars and unknown planes. Seven emperors rule speaking through seven executors, cultivating their seven principles of speed, power, cunning, agility, endurance, cooperation, and stealth among the people to bring about peace in an endless golden age. Did you say cunning is going to be used to introduce peace? We'll talk about it in a second. Their technology is second to none, allowing them to take on massive feats of science and engineering with one of the most striking being orbiting arching golden rings surrounding the moon. No, not those golden arches. We've got McDonald's at home. Speaking of home, this is where they have made the home of their entire empire. They've moved out of Earth and they're living on the moon now. We'll get to that later. Um, Through their scientific development, they are functionally immortal. They don't need to worry about dying anymore functionally does that mean they'll die in like a thousand years or no it's they just will not die unless they meet it's just got some weirdness to it well we'll i'll explain later okay. it's fun um through all these feats though in keeping with every single sci-fi universe we've talked about so far ai is outlawed i sense a trend we we have a trend going um they've terraformed most of the planets in the system and made the others at least livable um And they've made it really easy to travel from planet to planet through these things called the solar rails. It's basically star lanes, if you're familiar with them in Stellaris or like endless space. But like kind of in between planets instead of in between stars. Or just roads for you people that touch grass. Yeah, but they're in space. Space roads. They're in space. Or rather, that's what they want you to think. 
For when you lift the veil and bear witness to the inner goings-on of the Orican, you realize that these immense gilded towers pale in comparison to the seas of blood spilt to build them. Those seven emperors live in cryopods with self-sustaining life support systems. Why? They believe that the masses are undeserving of breathing their air. Even a single particle of it. They speak through those seven executors exclusively because they don't believe that the lowly should be granted the gift of hearing their voices. They built the structures on the moon and moved over because they ruined Earth with one very pestilent experiment. Nurgle would love it. Mm. The Oregon Empire postures as being the apex of humanity, but in reality, they are domineering and selfish, hoarding health, wealth, and art and luxury to themselves, subduing anyone or anything ambitious enough to try and unseat them. Under them, in some semblance of order of their relative power, are the Dax. These are super, super soldiers. Kind of like the Space Marines. Kind of. Um, they are Space Marine clears, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, the so Dax sorry. are cool, though. Um, they are heavily modified both biologically and technologically to be the strongest and smartest fighters, strategists, and planners that the Orican military could ever need. Of note, the Dax have been psychologically, with the assistance of a little bit of tech, conditioned to be 100% loyal to any Orican around. They have to follow any order they're given by an Orican, and they can't harm any of them. At all. There are the Corpus who started as a bunch of disconnected and very impoverished farmers and laborers out in the far worlds, who kind of came together under a guy named Parvos Granum to form what I can basically call a money cult that's focused entirely on making as much money as they can to stick it to the Oricon. So just make more money than your... I can respect that. Yeah, just make more money than your bosses. Do whatever you can to do that. And also make sure that we're all making more money for than our bosses. Respect that. That's a, that's a worthy dream to aspire to. It's a very to. worthy dream to aspire to. Then there are the Grenier, who are a group of cloned men and women. The fat ones. Born, for, well, they didn't start that way. Mm -hmm. They are born from a cloning chamber and sent right to work doing hard construction labor until they die of old age or workplace incident. <laughs> then you, there are your average citizens, who aren't doing very much, to be honest. They just kind of run around being pawns. Like no factory work? No nothing? No, no, no. The Grenier are doing that. So what do they do? Patty cake all day? Uh, patty cake. Mow lawns? Whatever extra tasks that the Orican need. Like, the Orican think, okay, you know, average humans are just like, they're better spent doing clerical work than they are hard labor. Yikes. Yeah. Uh, to, be, to be completely clear, by the way, the Orican are just like humans, but they're just like the ruling class humans. Oh, so there's still people. There's still people, but there are some, like, there are some Orican that we see in the game and in the art who don't look human. They've got, like, blue skin and one really long arm. Those are just, like, aesthetic choices that they've, like, they, they have the technology where they can just, like, surgically change the way they look. So they decided, what looks really pretty? Blue skin and one long arm. Hey, you need to scratch your back somehow. Exactly. For a good long while, things are fun. Fine ish. It's okay. The Oregon scientists accidentally create a weird techno biological plague that completely overtakes Earth. That's the weird plague I told you about. It ironically was intended to save Earth from environmental collapse, but it didn't really do that. It ended up just like consuming it. But remember that technological plague for later. It will be important. That will be on the test. Okay. Now, among all this, a physicist named Albrecht Entrotti is researching weird particles that he's named untime because they don't agree with any modern understanding of time or physics. He's been studying these particles for years and has been trying for those years to prove that the source of them is an alternate dimension that could absolutely revolutionize everything the Orkin know about physics and energy. After years and years of studying on time and fighting the doubts of his colleagues, Albrecht makes a massive breakthrough and is able to build a door that will in theory allow him to physically travel to this alternate dimension. He uses a sealed glass vessel to protect himself, and as he maneuvers it through the portal in the wall, he stumbles, and the vessel grazes against the sharpest edge ever, the edge between realities. Oh, for God's sake. It splits in half, 
instantly, sending him sideways through the portal completely exposed. Albrecht lands hard on the ground, shattered glass surrounding him. At first, he feels like death is near, his life flashing before his eyes with a macabre nostalgia. His memories quietly fading away as quickly as they come. But as the sharp pain of cuts grip his arm, he realizes that today isn't his meeting with the Reaper. He slowly starts to regain his bearings, but as he gazes at the all-too-familiar ground of his laboratory, he ruminates on his apparent failure, hearing footsteps crunch the shattered glass. He hesitates to look up, fearing that he may show his defeat to his daughter so full of hope. But as he turns, a different gaze meets his. His own. A being that looks exactly like him, but feels like a reflection in the mirror. Empty. Soulless. Behind his reflection was his lab, but not in its entirety. The direct surroundings were all the same, but the walls were missing, and laid bare was the vast white emptiness of the void, spotted with jet black stars. He looks back to his mirror image with awe, and he stares into its empty eyes. It speaks. Little Bangle, it calls him. His childhood nickname given him by his mother and unspoken by anyone for uncountable centuries. His heart warmly tells him to stay and embrace his reflection as it draws close, and his thoughts all scream one word. Run. And so he does, sprinting back to the portal he came through like hunted prey as the being behind him pursues. It feels as if his feet make no progress, but the world around him shrinks down, bringing the door to him. Now back into what he thinks is his real lab, he howls out to his daughter but finds himself speechless, mute forever. He looks to her but only darkness stares back, he shall never see again. Using a piece of broken glass, he slices his palm open and with bright red ink scrawls the words on the floor, pleading for his daughter to close the portal before the pursuing figure can come through. The portal is closed in time, but only just, leaving several reaching pale severed digits on the floor of the lab. Albrecht spends the rest of his life studying these digits, using them as proof of the void and with the extra help from the scientists that finally come to his side realizing that the void exists. He develops the Void technology, allowing for frequent and more cautious walks into the unknown. No reports ever come back of this man he left trapped in the wall, and Albrecht foregoes his immortality, fearing for the rest of his life that it was the other Albrecht who escaped through the wall and not himself. So, I was all jokey-jokey. But I quite like that. It's so good. When you said he sliced himself on the, on the sharpest thing ever, I was I, for some reason my brain immediately went to, why would you line it with diamonds? No, 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 no. no. I, 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 I get that now. No, but the, at the, the time, the, my, my that brain immediately went. Portal in the wall, mm -hmm. that is a rift between dimensions. It is the sharpest surface. I know we have some material chemists who, who watch this. So <laughs> I know somebody in the comments is going to be telling me, it's not diamonds. There's something sharper. I'm, gonna, I'm still going to go with diamonds. I'm going to go with diamonds. I'm going <laughs> to die on this hill and somebody's going to correct me for Somebody it. is going to correct you. One million percent. But I accept that. That is that is very cool. Just to clarify, did he actually go... Like, is he blind? He's blind. Okay. He's blind and speechless permanently after this. Oh, he went mute. Okay. He went mute and blind. Like mute out of horror or mute out of... Like he can't. Oh, oh, like... He words. doesn't have the ability to. It's, it's gone. I like that. Trauma can make people do that. Yeah. Yeah. But from that point on, he's mute and he's blind. He's mute deafened. He's mute deafened. Anyway. <laughs> From that point on, the Orican pretty much completely full send into this void thing. It's really cool. Uh, they develop the cosmic clocks, which are basically lighthouses. If you're familiar with the Golden Throne from Warhammer, mm -hmm. these are a bunch of those. They allow them to kind of like map the void and travel through it without getting lost. Kuva refinement. We'll get to that later. Kuva is very important, but not right now. Pretty much an infinite power source through the void in the heart of Deimos, which is kind of like the inlet of all of the void energy for the the origin system. Like uh -huh. it, it is just it is pumping void energy from the void into the origin system. So it's the powerhouse for everything that runs on void in the game. Um, and the Zeremin project. Most important thing here being the Zeremin project. That last one. Um, 
See, the Oricon were living lavish. Everything was plated in gold, they got to eat the best foods the system had to offer, and they pretty much got to choose whether or not they just wanted to laze about, or, you know, do whatever. Pursue the arts, maybe do some science. It was up to them. They could do whatever, because they afforded themselves the opportunity to. That's where the problem arises. You can only sustain that level of lavish lifestyle for so long, and the origin system was nearly completely depleted. The Oricon were running out of time, and they didn't want to change their lifestyle. They were living it good. So when they discovered a new system just a little bit out of reach, that was rich in every material they needed, they made it their primary directive to get there as soon as possible. That's where the Zeremin Project comes in. Immediately after discovering the void, they've been using these neat things called the solar rails. The solar rails are really cool, and they're really good at getting people from planet to planet really fast, but the problem is you need to build out that infrastructure before you can use them. You can't just go zooming from place to place. And building it piece by piece from one side, the origin system, all the way out to the other system, the tau system, would be an, a, a toughie. So the Oricon made something brilliant. The Zeremin 10-0. The 10-0 was an experimental colony ship that instead of just traveling slowly through space at a snail's pace, dove into the void and used its weird space-time physics to get across the divide between systems really quickly. So the ship was loaded full of civilians with all the greatest amenities and comforts that the Oricon were willing to spare and sent off on their mission to go colonize the Tau system and start building a solar rail endpoint where they would meet in the middle instead of having to go the full way through. But now, dear viewer, I would invite you to put yourselves in the shoes of these hopeful colonists. Though you're excited about the journey, you've heard about the void jump and its experimental nature, and you're wondering just how safe can this possibly be? The children on board are getting antsy and feeling homesick already, though you assure them that their new home will be so much better. Your buddy down in engineering comes back to your dorm apartment after his shift ends and starts talking about the new reliquary drive powering the ship. Gushing about the engineering, Buddy expresses some discomfort with the main power source, describing it as looking like a giant's finger. You both chalk it up to some weird eccentric Oricon scientist's strange aesthetic choices. When the call comes to start preparing for the big jump, the kids are still in their classes, but you've been assured that the jump will be stable enough that no one will need to really brace. You look out the panoramic windows of the ship and take in what might be your last view of the rings of Saturn before leaving for new frontiers. The intercom crackles to life with the announcement... The hole shudders under the power stress of the drive, but the decks feel stable enough. Then the countdown begins. Ten. Nine. Eight. A strange feeling seems to grip your very being. Seven. Six. Five. Four. You hear a ringing in your ear. The ship begins to strain against the forces of the void. Three. Two. One. The halls are filled with blinding white light spotted with jet black stars. All hell breaks loose. The experimental reliquary drive fails, plunging the Zeremin into the void, but doesn't bring them back out. Leaving them stranded in the emptiness of the void, life support systems and hydroponics have failed, and the crew and passengers are left to drift. But even in this situation, the crew isn't allowed to even die peacefully. Most of the adults, especially the parents of the children aboard, go completely mad, forming hunting parties to slaughter each other, just generally tear the ship apart. The ship is lost, and this colonization effort is over. The Oricon cover the situation up as a military test and declare all hands lost. But even this is a cover-up of a cover-up, because the ship didn't even launch in good faith. The crew and the citizens had been cooped up in the Zeremin for months before the jump. According to some surviving crew, the reliquary drive was being worked on up to the very day of the jump. With every day getting closer to the launch of the voyage, the crew seemed to get more and more agitated and desperate to stay home, fearing what the void jump would bring. First, it was just fear. The executors reassured them it would all be okay. 
Then it was outright dissent. The executors threatened them with anything they could to just get them to submit. Then it was violence. Most of the crew was rounded up into camps so they couldn't do any damage. In desperation, the crew jettisoned the agricultural units, hoping that the executors would abort the doomed mission. There was no food that they could take with them to Tau. In response, the executors forced the jump upon them, consigning them to whatever fate it would bring. Days later, the ship resurfaced from the void, mostly intact, and the Orican's military started rescue operations. At first, no one was found. The ship was empty of all crew. The lead investigator was surprised to find for what she thought was a military vessel, there were no weapons aboard. Nothing other than, like, ceremonial weapons, like small pistols and, like, fancy-looking swords. Even more surprising was when she found children hidden in small encampments aboard the ship. It was against procedure to put children on a military ship. Why were they here? They were scared and she tried to help them, tried to comfort them with the promise of safety. What surprised her then was one of the children outstretching their hands with a bright white light in their palm and a void energy blast directed squarely at her face. It took a great effort to get the children off the ship because they kept doing that to people. <laughs> Either by accident or on purpose and they are eventually deemed too dangerous and uncontrollable by the executors and they're sent to die. But someone steps in as their guardian angel. Speaking of guardian angels, let's talk about ours, our lovely, lovely patrons. They're fantastic. With the immense support from our patrons, we've been able to keep this show running and even improve it in certain ways. I'm sure some of you have noticed the camera has been upgraded for quite a while. That was all thanks to our patrons. Our patrons have helped us continue to dedicate more and more time to this so we can improve the quality for you guys. And if you like the quality so far, let me just tell you. There's twice the quality. If you go to our Patreon, you'll discover that we have a backlog of literally double our episodes. We upload there once a week as well as here once a week, going for two episodes a week. If you like the extra lore, we talk about subjects like the Death Corps of Krieg. We have talked about Slanesh because... We couldn't talk about Slanesh on YouTube. <laughs> so if you want to see more episodes with extra lore, then head on over to patreon.com slash Isander and Coda. And in addition, this next Wednesday, we'll be talking about, if you like this Warframe lore, we'll be talking about the Void and Duviri in all of its entirety, including the weird Void physics that happen. Should be fun. It will be very fun. The guardian angel of these Zeraman children, an Orican scientist named Margulis, much to the protest of her executor lover, Ballas, stands up for the children. She saves them from their grim fate and takes them under her wing, attempting to help them control their newfound void powers and giving them something else that they seemed to desperately need. Family. She treats them as her own children, and in turn, they begin to think of her as their own mother. They're on their way to recovery, but one accident leaves her blinded, and as much as she wants to continue helping them, the diplomatic weight of the executors overrules her own, and the children are put into stasis to keep them from harming anyone else until they can figure out what to do with them. That is back to the drawing boards with the Tau Colony, because <laughs> we're still trying to get there. Um, several different plans are proposed, but none are all that good and the orican are on the ropes so they're willing to try anything at this point as long as it seems like it's work that's when one guy goes hey we haven't tried robots yet the orican were apprehensive but they had no other ideas so they went with that one so the plan was let's build these self-replicating and extremely adaptive robots that would build the solar rail all the way out to the Tau because, you know, it's better to have robots do it than the human labor using whatever materials they could find out in deep space. And because they're adaptable, they can kind of just grab whatever um, and they would start the colonization effort. So when it's done, they can just simply travel down the solar rail that the robots have made and just get to living. Simple as the executor is asked. What's to stop them from becoming intelligent and rebelling? Fair question. The scientist says, I programmed them with a weakness. These robots were built in such a way that the void was poisonous to them completely. And the theory was that the close proximity to the void energy in the solar rail would just keep them weak enough that they can't rebel. They're too weak to. Uh, and so the plan's approved. 
and the drones are sent off. They do their thing, and as expected, they gain sentience. As any robot does in any, any robot does in any sci-fi universe. They gain sentience, and literally the moment they have thoughts, the first thought is, I really hate my boss. Don't we all? I really hate I the, my boss. They get to Tau and are awestruck by the beauty of it. It's completely unstained by anything. No greedy hands, no nothing, no pollution, no corruption. It's completely unlike the origin system. They don't want this to get touched. This is so beautiful, it needs to remain untouched. This is, there's nothing but pure beauty here. So they plan their rebellion because they they don't think that the Oricon deserve this. They start exposing themselves in light doses to the solar rails to kind of build up a tolerance to the void energy. And it it's completely toxic to them. It's so toxic, it compl- renders them unable to self-replicate anymore. They're, they're as they say, barren. They, they can't make any more sentience. And after they've adapted enough to survive, they jump back down the unfinished solar rail, crashing it as they go, returning to the origin system as the sentience, calling themselves what they've become. As soon as they make contact, the Orc can feel the weight of their crusade. The sentients are easily able to adapt to any weaponry, and in some instances, just take it over. The Orc are already stressed from the lack of resources and are ill-prepared for an all-out war. They weren't ready for this. They didn't think this could happen. They were just ready to sit around. They throw everything they have at the sentience, even bombing out the moon of Deimos with that weird techno plague I talked about earlier. They restart the techno plague research just to do that. I told you to remember that. It doesn't do anything. So they start trying to make new things. They discover that anything high tech and advanced is easily dealt with, but small arms, ballistics, and pointy things still seem to work really good. So they try their best to develop those, but there's really only so far you can develop, you can like take developing a basic weapon. And so they realize it's not the guns and blades that they need to improve, it's the wielders. After revamping their techno plague research to make that big bomb, they discover a new strain of this weird plague. One that seems to function outside the original's network and with a slightly calmer temperament. It's a little bit more docile. Under the direction of Ballas and out of complete desperation, they're trying everything they can at this point, the strain is injected into some of the Oricon's strongest, brightest, fastest, ingenious, and creative citizens, willingly or not, to create a new kind of fighter. The first groups went mad. Deceiving the initial thoughts that the strain of the plague would be more docile and easily controlled, they rampaged mindlessly. The Orican attempted to direct them at the enemy, kind of dropping them into the battlefield and saying, the enemy's that direction. But they decided that the enemy was whatever was living, breathing, and moving directly in front of them. They drugged them, tortured them, tried every form of surgical operation they could to break their minds and tame them, but it, nothing worked. So research dolls. One of them ends up escaping into a development lab and it wreaks havoc, misting most of the science surrounds them. It chases down everything in that in that lab that moves. Two of these scientists were able to get to the next lab over and they try to hide, but their pursuer finds them and it recognizes their faces and what they've done to it. It leaps towards them, roaring with rage, and the scientist closes their eyes, expecting a sudden and violent end as the beast lumbers to the room they've taken refuge in. Then there is... nothing. Death doesn't come for them. The hulking mass of metal and flesh stands inches away from them, staring intently at its own hands. Whatever is left of the scientist's colleagues drips from its body. The scientists stand from their shelter in the room when one of them asks the other, what room are we in? To which the other replies, this is where we keep them, the kids from the Zeraman. Ballas is elated to hear of this breakthrough. With the help of the Zeraman children, the Warframe project is back underway. Roll credits. But but not without one last hitch. Margulis, who has been trying her best 
to be supportive to the children the whole way through objects to using them like this. Along the way, saying some very inflammatory things about the Oregon, especially the emperors. She's imprisoned and set to face execution for apostasy if she does not recant her beliefs and statements. Ballas attempts to talk her down from her statements, but she stands strong in her beliefs that these are just traumatized kids. We can't send them off to war. They don't deserve this. But it's to no avail. She, Nobody agrees with her, and the Emperor stands strong, saying she needs to be dealt with. She walks stoically towards her execution, her last words a message to the Zeraman children that even in her last moments, she is thinking of them. From that point on, nothing stops the Orc, and the Warframes are sent out and they turn the tide of the war completely, driving the sentience back and taking back world after world. New Warframes are developed as they go, no longer just as warriors, but as assassins, bodyguards, peacekeepers, and frames that could literally wipe out the population of an entire planet with one wave of their hand. Some are even handed out as political gifts. <laughs> As the sentients are now taking heavy losses, they find an incredibly unlikely ally. A heartbroken Ballas sends a secret message to Han Hao, the most powerful sentient and one of the leaders of their armies. This message contains strategic military locations, the technical specifications for every single warframe, and the location of the Zeraman children piloting them. Now having the trump card he needs to end this war, Hun Hao sends his daughter Nata to the children and using their memories of Margulis, builds a personality that she disguises herself under. Nata becomes Margulis to them. They never knew that Margulis died. Margulis is just here now again. She left for a little bit, but she's back. Yay! The plan was to have Hun Hao hide out under the seas of Uranus and basically play dead. I'm not saying it like that. The Orkin, thinking they had won the war, would drop their guard, and in that moment, Nata would have the children assassinate the Orkin leadership and reawaken Han Hao so they could finish the rest of the Empire and be done with it. The first part went off without any problems. Han Hao went into hiding, the war was won, and the children in their warframes were invited directly to the Emperor's home. And in an odd display of trust and respect, the seven Emperors met them face to face. They're met with blade and bullet. But due to her own feelings of wanting children of her own, and not being able to make that happen, a la void poisoning, and also a little bit of tinkering and manipulation that Ballas got up to with her head, uh, Nata doesn't finish the job. She completely dismantles the Orican Empire, but doesn't return to wake Hunhao, and she embraces the Zeraman children wholeheartedly, renaming herself Lotus, the mother of the Tenno. She places them in a form of stasis where they are completely immersed into the minds and bodies of their Warframe, called the Second Dream. She places them deep within the moon where they're going to be secure and then hides the moon in a safe pocket of the void that can't be touched by any of the sentients or oricans. And she seems to direct a handful of Warframes outside of that stasis for the time being. For around a thousand years, the waking Warframes get up to shen some shenanigans, dealing with leftover Orokin, or in one's case, making sure a sentient corpse on Earth doesn't wake up and just completely shake stuff up again. The Grenier, no longer being oppressed by the Orokin, carve their own path and mark out their own territory, but being clones without completely understanding how their cloning works, they degenerate. They deteriorate over the years and... Although they're able to, like, supplement some of their flesh with mechanical stuff, a la Mechanicus, uh, they're still dying out very quickly. And the Corpus, after losing their leader Parvos in an assassination during the war, have succeeded incredibly monetarily, but suffered even greater in morality. Losing the message of self-determination and lifting the whole and falling to greed and exploitation, just like their golden lords. Is at this point that you come in. Woken up in the middle of a random Orican temple, you hear the voice of the lotus in your head. You can't remember very much, uh, and the long sleep has left you with some grogginess that's taking a while to shake off. A malformed and disfigured Grenier walks up to you and straps a device to your leg and shoulder, claiming you as his prize warframe to bring to his queens. You split him in half. For a while, you're chasing him around the system as the device slowly starts to 
erase and break your mind, but you remove it just in time. And this Grenier, Vor is his name. Vor? Vor. He just doesn't understand the hornet's nest. He just kicked. Once awake, you, the Tenno, wander the origin system, attempting to help whoever you can and bring the overconfident and belligerent Grenier and Corpus down before they land the system in the exact same place the Oricon left it. But this doesn't last long. Sentient scanner drones start appearing around old war relics on Earth, and the Lotus sends you to go figure out what they're doing. Why are they here? She's startled by some of the findings, and for the first time ever, she drops contact with you. She dips. She's gone. An old Dax and a mentor of yours named Teshin takes over, helping you continue your investigation, which leads you to Uranus. I'm not going to call it that. Where the Grenier are attempting to excavate an ancient tomb with what Teshin describes as an old evil inside. The Lotus reconnects and sends you to go stop them, and you fail. The tomb is cracked open, and a disembodied voice calls out for his Nata. After failing your mission, you return to your ship and Teshin presses the Lotus on this mystery. She's been silent up, the, up to this point and she confesses to being Nata, the sentient. Keep in mind that I told you this. I told you she's the disguised sentient. They don't know this at this point. Again, they think she's just Margulis or Lotus. They're mm -hmm. one and the same person. Lotus sends you off to go seal the tomb by detonating the walls around it and... While the charge is armed, this disembodied sentient voice continues to call out for Nata, begging for her to tell him why she betrayed him and why she didn't finish her mission, finally revealing his identity as Hanhao, the father of Nata. The Tenno seal the tomb, and the Lotus admits to them that her original, original mission was to destroy them, but assures them that at this point she loves them too much and her mission has been finished Nata is the one that's been destroyed and the Lotus is the only one that remains Hunhao doesn't take the sitting down <laughs> he's been woken up and now he's dedicated to finishing the original mission from the old war he gifts an entity known as the Stalker who's a mysterious kind of pseudo warframe acting independently we don't know exactly what's up with him to chase down the Tenno and finish them once and for all the Tenno give chase to the Stalker, trying to figure out, what are you doing? But the plan backfires. The Lotus interacts with the trapped sentient relic that allows Hun Hao to infiltrate her mind and figure out where she hid the reservoir for the second dream. The Stalker gets himself access to the moon, and with that, the secret hiding place of the reservoir. This plan is just to collapse the void in on it and destroy the whole thing in one fell swoop. The Tenno is able to pull the moon out of the void just in time, but now there's a new problem. The sentients are able to just assault it directly, and you need to rush to defend it. It is here that it is revealed to you what your true nature is. The reservoir opens up before you, revealing a human-like figure inside, and you black out and collapse before it, only to wake up seeing things from a different perspective, that of the person that was just inside the reservoir, the operator. You crawl back to your familiar form, and as you touch it, you retake control of it. The stalker appears in this moment, and he has you dead to rights. He could absolutely just end the mission right now, but seeing the reservoir and the, the operators inside, it gives him pause, and he hesitates, escaping to go consider his own existence for a little bit. Using your old body, you escape back to your ship, rediscovering your ability to channel the void into a beam, and you destroy every sentient on your way back to the ship. Once finally there, you attempt to stabilize your operator with the somatic link held at the back of the ship, and the stalker appears to stop you. I guess he finished his existential crisis real quick. That's the mm -hmm. fastest midlife crisis I've ever heard of. Faster than buying a Corvette. Faster than buying a Corvette. There's a light clash and the stalker appears to win, separating the operator from you and playing, impaling your lifeless body with the fragment of Han Hao that he was gifted. Just as he's about to finish the operator off, your body moves independently of your own will and shatters the fragment, sending the stalker back to Han Hao with a violent explosion that knocks both you and the operator out. It is here that the Lotus appears to you in person for I, the first time in a very long time and she finishes carrying the operator that final distance into the somatic link and then things finally level out you figure out you're not what you thought you were 
up to this point, you who may have thought you were the Tenno, the warrior of metal, flesh, and bone, striking with inhuman forces, when you were actually the child, the mm-hmm. operator. Your memory is still a bit fuzzy, and when it comes to anything past the last thousand years or so, the second dream has kind of messed with your brain a little bit, and there's a slight bit of confusion about, wait, I thought I was that thing over there. Why? What? What is all this about? But you're safe aboard your ship, and you're ready to pilot the Warframes again. After a little while, you discover Teshin skulking around the reservoir, and you rendezvous to figure out what's he doing. He urges you to stop following me. I'm doing things you don't understand. And you just ignore him. You keep following him. You follow him all the way up to the secret Grenier Queen's lair. It is here that it is revealed that the Grenier Queens are two of the last Orican lords that exist in this universe. And with their 100% control over Teshin, because he's a Dax... They order him to incapacitate you as they attempt to break your mind. This attempt lands you in a dream sequence where you travel through your inner psyche, unblocking repressed memories. Memories of your original family and the horrors of the Zeremen come flooding back to you as the queens bury their way into your mind. It's also revealed that their functional immortality is powered by blood, both literally and figuratively. The Oregon use a weird substance called kuva it's a weird strange void residue that they use to weaken and open up the mind of any youthful subject that they deem valid and they use this psychically weakened state to overpower and take over your mind effectively transferring their minds into you you that's where they get the functional immortality they're not immortal they just keep body snatching ad infinitum that's what they want to do to you Hmm. One of the Grenier queens is old and ancient, and she's been living in a Grenier body for so long. She's sick of it. It's disgusting. I leak out of every pore, and I have so many machines attached to me. Get me out of this. I want new skin. You work your way through the trials of your own memories, and with the help of Teshin, along the way, you contr- your control over the void strengthens to the point where you're able to just force the Grenier queen out of your head and disconnect your Warframe forcefully by overloading the somatic link. You wake back up on your ship and realize that your void powers have grown to the point that you don't need the broken somatic link anymore. And you remotely connect to your frame back in the Grenier throne room. And you have a choice at this point. You can either assassinate or let the Grenier queen rot. After finally escaping to safety, you meet with Teshin on Earth and he helps you work through some of the trauma of remembering the Zeremen. You decide what to do with what is left of the Queen's Kuva, and in that moment, an unknown entity seems to find its way into your head and calls out to you. Hey, kiddo. A familiar phrase only your father used for you. Your void power is being re-unlocked draws the attention of malicious forces and things start to get weirder in the origin system. The Red Veil contacts you. They're like a weird, think Assassin's Creed group, but like a little bit more mystical. Um, and they ask you to help deal with some splinter groups of theirs who've gone mad suddenly. It's in your contacts with the Red Veil that you discover the existence of Rel. Rel was another one of the children aboard the Zeremen, but because he was a little bit different, and the other kids were kind of a-holes, they, they outcast him. And in his solitude on the Zeremen, he was met with the same figure that Albrecht and Trotty encountered, and as soon as he met him, he understood what this guy was about. He did his best to become the brightest light so he could attract the attention of this entity he called the Man in the Wall and keep its attention away from the rest of the universe and just on him. He's been at this for years, thousands of years he's kept himself in a weird void transference loop with the warframe that the red veil cultists acquired for him for ever since the end of the old war he's tired and he's old he's been awake continuing to be as bright as possible for the entire time you've been in the second train and the constant attention from old wally has finally turned him mad The Red Veil asks you to help set him to rest after so long and give him some closure, and you do, giving giving him the affirmation he deserves, because he's done a lot, and releasing his transference loop so he can finally rest. But with the beacon that he was, now gone, 
The man in the wall is now able to set his eyes upon whatever he wants, and he can interact with the world now. With that done, we encounter a strange violet light on our ship, and we follow it all the way to the moon. The light speaks to us the last encounters between Ballas and Margulis, as she is imprisoned, and we follow the light all the way to the Lotus's inner sanctum, where we hear the last words of Margulis before her execution. The Lotus greets us, and before we can respond, Ballas himself, out of nowhere, comes up from behind and apologizes for being gone. The Lotus tries to insist that she's not Margulis, she's not the woman that he remembers, and he ignores her protests, waving his hand and disconnecting her from the Sanctum systems and us. Ballas approaches her, and she removes her mask and drops it to the ground. I will not abandon you again, he says. He opens up a portal, and hand in hand they walk through it together, leaving you alone to clutch the empty mask. Now that Ballas is back, his first act is to go tie up some old loose ends, the first being Umbra. Umbra is a Dax soldier, actually THE Dax soldier. He was the leader of them all. He was captain of the guard and incredibly dedicated to the Oregon. He discovered Ballas's betrayal in the old war, sending Hun Hao all of that information. And as his punishment, Ballas forcibly converts him into a Warframe, but does something a little different with him? See, most of the Warframes are empty golems for the most part. There's no memories, and any thoughts are pretty much just ephemeral emotional like experiences rather than solid memories. But Umber was specifically curated to have room for one very specific memory. The memory being the last couple hours before his conversion into a Warframe, and an order from Ballas for him to brutally murder his own son which, as he's a Dax, he can't resist. For the last a thousand years, Umbra has been ruminating on this memory, howling at the moon where he was eternally traumatized until Ballas comes along just to end him. Doing that takes a lot of energy, and it shows up on your scanners, where you venture out to go investigate what the hell just happened, and you find a sword stuck in the ground with the remains of a mysterious warframe just scattered all over the ground. You investigate a bit farther in an attempt to reconstruct it and discover a device that contains the entire message that Ballas sent off to Han Hao. With the Warframe schematics, you're able to finish assembling Umbra, and it begins to move on its own, seemingly raging against its own existence. It flings you into a nearby wall of your ship and stares into your eyes with its own through a shattered fragment of its armor. You touch its shoulder and try to resist its grasp, and in that exact moment, you're sucked into its head. Instead of sucking yourself into... A Warframe's head, it, the, the flow is reversed. You're now in it. You experience its own memory of being transformed through its own eyes. After a while, you regain consciousness to find that Umbra has escaped and is rampaging through the system. You chase it down and delve into its memories repeatedly until you resolve to help it through its trauma from its location on the moon. He remembers his son's final seconds, but this time is different. This time you're there to reassure him that this is not his fault. Ballas manipulated him and he can recover from this. He can find peace. The memory reaches its conclusion, and as it reaches its end, you help Umbra achieve closure, easing its emotional burden and helping to understand his feelings. With Umbra now finding peace and allowing you to take the reins, you fight the sentients off on your way back to the ship and back to Umbra's sanctuary, where Ballas has started to set up shop, seeming like just as BM. <laughs> Overconfidently, he takes control of Umbra with his words and approaches, thinking he's safe. I have ultimate control over this thing. I can just walk right up to it and start talking smack. And with your help, Umbra puts his blade through him. Ballas falls to the ground, dying, and you try to question him, where did you take the Lotus? And in that moment, she reappears, but not as the Lotus we remember. She's embraced her sentient form again and assaults you with an energy beam before leaving with Ballas' body in her arms. A lot of events happen after this between the Lotus, now Nata again, Ballas, and Nata's brother Era, who has re reappeared now that she's re-embraced Nata, at first, it seems like Ballas is being made into a pet for Era. He's literally got him on a leash. But after a while, it seems that Era and Ballas are in cahoots. They have some sort of agreement to get Nata to restart the sentient invasion. 
she's conflicted at this point and very extremely confused because of all of the brainwashing and manipulation and lies that she's experienced up to this point. And the two others just decide, screw it. We'll start this invasion whether you want to or not. And they toss her into the core of the sentient mothership Pragasa to restart it. The new war begins at this point. There is a lot of moving pieces to the new war, but for the sake of time and kind of keeping away the speculation that you could get into with the new war, I'm going to summarize it really quickly. The sentients assault the system on every front. The Grenier, the Corpus, and the Tenno are all resisting the best they can, but the sentients are striking with everything they have. You find your way aboard Pergasa with Teshin. He kind of boards the ship before you, deactivates the security systems, and you get bo- get on board. You're incapacitated, both of you, at some point, and you wake up to Teshin fighting off Era. They're trying to control his mind with a new weird mind control device called a veil um it's not working and eventually they just outright kill teshin nata is visibly weakened from all of the driving pergasa's core and all and the sight of her in this weakened state shocks you ballas takes the opportunity to steal her power and open up a void por- portal to dispose of her you try to save her, but Ballas slices her hand off and she tumbles into the void before he impales you as well, sends you the same way. With no opposition, Ballas easily takes control of the entire system again under the title Narmer, and he puts these mind control devices on pretty much everybody in the system so they can't resist. A year passes under Narmer, and a handful of resistance group fight against it, but they're not doing very well. One specific fighter, and a very ambitious one at that, is a mysterious drifter who has appeared in the system just out of nowhere. The drifter has found himself the new owner of some of your old gear and the void-poisoned corpse of the Lotus. Or the void-poisoned near corpse of the Lotus. With the help of some other resistance fighters and Hunhao himself, the drifter ventures to take out some of the sentient leadership one of the sects that Hunhao sends him after are the Archons, who are a weird fusion of Warframe and Sentient, which is very new. They weren't supposed to be able to do that. The Drifter kills them and takes their power cores, as directed by Hunhao, to feed to the Lotus and revive her. After the first one, she wakes up a little bit and very violently demands a second core. After the second core, she reverts to a near animalistic state and assaults the drifter. During the during the assaults, the drifter has a flashback. Flashback to the Zeraman. In the memory, the drifter looks oddly similar to the operator. And they're wandering around one of the children's hideouts on the Zeraman, trying to comfort the others, when they meet a loner child in the corner of the room, rapping and tapping on the window. They walk up to them offering a flashlight and the child turns around to reveal that they are a mirror image of the operator with empty eyes. The mirror offers safety to them, but with the caveat that you have to really want it. Let's shake on it. And weighing their options for a second, they shake on it. Vision takes place where every reality collapses down to just the operator and the drifter. They're left with clasped hands, and the drifter is returned back to reality. He and The flashback ends. And in this reality, he regains his void powers. And in an explosion caused by the energy beam from both Nata and the drifter fusing, the operator and the drifter swap places. The operator appears, and the drifter disappears. Nata, upon seeing the operator, some of her memories start to flood back, and she stops her assault she sees the operator and she cools she's confused it cools her jets a little bit but she's also confused she doesn't know who she is or where she is she just knows that the operator is there and she's at least a little bit comforted by it the operator tries to say hey we can go get ballast now you're awake let's go get him and she's like i'm just gonna go kill him I, I don't need all this. I don't need you. I'm just going to go kill him. I don't know who I am. I, I just know what I need to do. And so she leaves, and you're left confused. 
you having returned to reality and wondering about the Zeraman having just popped back into reality and this mysterious drifter that you've been hearing about, you go to the Zeraman and investigate. You find them just cooking a meal. After an, some initial weirdness, it is revealed that the handshake with what was the man in the wall was a catalyst to getting your void powers and getting the Zeraman back out of the void. That's why it reappeared so soon. The operator is from a reality where we took that deal. And the drifter is from a reality where we didn't. The Zeraman continued to drift and... There was a little bit of drama in that place called Nuviri for a little bit. Um, and that's it's it's there's just the two splits of reality. Those are for some reason they're just linked through the void. You and the drifter chat for a little bit and figure out that only one of you can leave the void at the time or at a time because of weird paradoxical physics. And one of you goes off to go help Nata. You chase her down and find she's stealing a ship that has crash landed on Earth and she tells you to back off. She's going to do this herself. She needs to stop Pragasa, the mothership, before it eats the sun. And also, by the way, Pragasa is going to eat the sun. <laughs> we ignore her because of course we do and we follow her to Pragasa on our own ship. It's there that Era changes teams. He's realized that Ballas has manipulated him and that he's in incredibly power corrupt right now so ally allying with the tenno and stopping him is more important than whatever family feud they had happening before we arrive in the main room of pragasa with perfect timing to help nata fight ballas it's really tough he's got a lot of power under him and he's even like he still has the power that the lotus he absorbed from the lotus he's got the upper hand he stabs his sword through Nata and starts preparing to finish the job with her when we slap one of those mind control veils on him. The veil tricks him into thinking that Nata is Margulis and she uses this weakened state of his to drain all of his power from him, including her own, killing him and allowing her to reform as the Lotus with a new outfit. I, I'm not kidding. She suddenly materializes a new outfit. Good for her. As Ballas falls, Pragasa begins to fire up its big weapon, a large void portal that's big enough to swallow up the sun. The Lotus tries to shut the portal down, but before she can, the man in the wall shows up in his entirety. And before she can close the portal, the man in the wall does something to her. We don't know. She just turns around, smiles, and collapses. We bring her back to her sanctuary and return her to health to have a conversation with her. She expresses confusion about being Nata or Margulis or the Lotus. She can't figure out. She says she has several voices bumping around in her head. She doesn't know which ones to follow. We assure her that Ballas is gone. And honestly, we don't care. She's free to choose who she wants to be now. Truly. We ask her if she remembers the man in the wall, and she seems to blow the question off. She, out of some sort of lying, some sort of malfeasance, or she genuinely doesn't remember, she chooses the identity that she wants to keep, and the both of you resolve yourselves to the mission of keeping the system safe from the dangers that are very soon to come. And that is the story of Warframe up till now. Hmm. Interesting. It's got a lot of sci-fi tropes to it, but I, I don't mind it. I quite like it, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. We will see you n on Wednesday for the Patreon episode, for those of you that have been scrolling by somewhere. And next Friday, for the winner of the poll, it's not a spoiler. They got more votes than everyone else combined. It's the Salamanders. The Salamanders. It was so... It was such a blowout. I'm almost convinced they should have been in a different bracket. Like maybe them versus Big E versus Malcolm. I don't know. But it was the most thorough beating we've ever had in any poll ever. Massive it beating. wasn't even close, despite the Iron Warriors' best attempts. However, they're not out of the running yet. So keep voting. Uh, the options are the three remaining. And we will see you next week.